great, great, great. Yes. Perfect. All right, y'all. I'm happy that this is happening. Yes, and me um, too. Eurasia, can you do me a favor? Can you switch from off the screen for me so it could like it could be our um because it's coming up with the is that is this the um front of the of the PowerPoint that you want to show? Yeah. Okay, perfect. You can just leave that there. That that works. Do we all have, um, I know we can all share the screen. So are we just going to, as we switch, like we're just going to each one person stop sharing and then we share our screen? Is that the plan? I think so. Well, okay. I don't know, no, no, y'all figure it out. Cause I'm like I said, I'm just. What do you think Z? I'm not sure if Taliba's here. I'm you know what I think that we should just leave it the way that it is now um I'm and not sure just... how, how it looks to other people but if we this way there's continuity if somebody mm -hmm. needs to change the slide as whoever's um controlling just the to slide to go to the next slide. yeah because yeah. I feel like it would be really contrived to figure out you know yeah. what I mean okay I what you, okay I'm sorry what do you you guys you got to talk you got to talk baby language I'm sorry. <laughs> okay so my <laughs> So Mama Tengaji, you see how we have the 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 slides up right now? Mm -hmm. yep, what yep. Asia was asking is if we should kind of go one at a time when we do our slides, but the person who's speaking, they would have control of the slides. The problem is that seems kind of contrived, like that would be too complicated. So instead, mm -hmm. we'll just have one person control the slides while mm -hmm. each person speaks. So it's just the same person. Okay, perfect. Who's going to do that? Um, it's on Taliba now, so. Okay. Um, right. Mama Chinganji, the oh, video yeah. you sent is the one that we already have. It is? Okay, hold yeah. on. Yeah. Hold on a okay, second. I just want to note that it, um, I don't know, what, like, it, it's live now, so. I know. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> no, 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 there's already people coming in, so we have. Oh, gotcha. Defense. I mean, it's 80, it's already filled up. Is, oh, really? Okay. Let me yes. Oh, I see it. I see it. You okay. see it? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize, realize it had, you know, started. So. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> People are coming. I know. <laughs> <laughs> be right on time. No prep. Yes. This is Just real quick, y'all, which I already think I know the answer. But you all can see my chat box, right? Yes, we can see. Okay, we cool. can see the, the beautiful red lipstick too. Uh, <laughs> I know, like this this red, like I mean. Oh yes, I didn't see. I can't. I can't compare it to you. <laughs> oh, I see it now. Okay, wow. All right, ninety-seven. Great reflections. Okay. I, oh, and then Jamie, you say you're gonna share the YouTube link. Yes. So once I um introduce everyone i'm going to share the youtube i just shared it to the panelists um so you should have it in there but then i'm going to send out emails to everybody so hey y'all hey hey y'all <laughs> free land oh wow it's already filled to capacity as soon as it started so um this is really great so let's let's just get started right now y'all ready yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. So, hi everyone. I hope all is well. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jamie Swift. I am the executive director of Black Women Radicals, and it's really, really nice to be in community with these amazing, powerful uh, Black women active, activists, Black Women Radicals, who I look up to from Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Um, and I'm just really grateful for them leading this wonderful teaching on Nahanda and Asada beyond symbolism and hashtag. Um, this is very important because a lot of times, like the title of the event suggests that we just see symbolism and hashtags of these radical black women, but what did they stand for? What, did, what, is, what are their politics mean? What does their leadership mean? And so these panelists 
will be discussing that in depth and in detail. But one thing I will ask is if you could please respect the space. So this space is a safe space. So we don't accept any homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, massage noir, ableism, any, any surveilling and attacking, we don't do that. And if you don't abide by it, I will have to kick you out. So um, before we get started, I would love to introduce our amazing esteemed panelists or leaders of the teaching, uh, who I'm so happy to, um, like I said, be in community with. So the first person I would like to introduce is Mama Chinganji Akinyela, who is the founding member of the New African People's Organization and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. She also is the founding member of the New African Women's Task Force. She has served and or she has organized numerous international and national women's conferences, one most notably an international women's conference in Havana, Cuba, in which she worked with Nahanda Abiodun. She has been an activist her entire adult life, and as the struggle continues, so will her, so will her work. She married her comrade 40 years ago and is a proud mother and grandmother. So thank you so much, Mama Chinganji, for being here, and um, I'm looking forward to the teaching. Thanks for having me, sis. Of course, of course. Next up, we have Derasia, who is a native of Philadelphia and, a co and the co-founder of the Philadelphia chapter of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. She connected to the new African independence movement while a student of African-American studies at Temple University. In 2011, Derasia co-authored the text, What Sisters Want, What Sisters Believe, Black Feminist's 12-point plan, which was published in the book, Ain't, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, 40 Years of Movement Building with Barbara Smith. She has organized around political prisoners, Black land and farming, and education disparities. She currently works as an educator in North Philadelphia. So thank you so much, Teresa. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Free to land, everybody. Great. So next up is Zalika U. Ibarimi, who is a Philadelphia Black queer femme, and a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. A former member of Black Lives Matter Philly, she joined MXGM as a master's student during her time at Georgia State University. Ibarimi is currently a doctoral student of Black studies who work, whose work investigates Black femmes and their spectators' ways of knowing shame and illegible desires through digital and material public spaces. Along with her comrades, she believes that radical work must, be, must include a Black gender and sexual politic that is informed by the analysis of visual culture studies, Black feminisms, womanism, Black queerness, and sex work. Um, Z, I'm always happy to see you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Taliba, who is a comrade, mother, daughter, sister, foot soldier, and a dreamer for a new South. Currently, Taliba is the national coordinator of Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, an international human rights organization demanding self-determination for African descendants in the United States. She had the opportunity to meet and see Mama Nahanda Abiodun work with the Cuban hip hop community. As a part of the New African Women's Caucus, her and her comrades teach on new African womanism in the context of revolutionary nationalism while organizing local campaigns around issues that affect black women. So thanks so much to Liba for being with us. Great, great. So I will be gone. And so I'm turning over this amazing teaching to our amazing panelists. Cool. Free to land, everyone. Am I from you? Okay, great. So thank you so much for those introductions. Um, and we're totally excited and ready to be here with you all. As we jump into the panel or the teaching for tonight um, on uh, Nahanda and Asada beyond civilism and hashtags, we just wanted to also ground this quickly and let you know um, our objectives for tonight. And so essentially we want to introduce the Malcolm X grassroots. Oops, this is on play. We wanted to introduce the Malcolm X grassroots movement. We wanted to discuss Nahanda and Asada. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fun, yay. And then we wanted to share lessons that are needed for today and also give a call to action. And so, um, yeah, and apologies since I'm sharing the screen, I definitely can't um, see the chat box at the moment. So any of my co-panelists definitely let me know 
if the box or someone is asking to slow down or move from there. So quickly, um, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement is um, a human rights organization demanding the liberation and self-determination for all new Africans. We organize around six principles, which are here. Again, we defend the human rights of all African people in the United States and around the world. That's like all the entire whole um, Black nation, regardless of gender, sexuality, identity, religion, class, and all those things. We also demand reparations for the enslavement of our ancestors um, and the continual experience of our Black folks here. We definitely promote self-determination as a collective term, uh, liberation, and we know that Black folks should be in control and in decision-making power for their lives. We oppose genocide experienced by our ancestors um, through the colonial building of, of this empire, but also the continued genocidal um, conditions, which we all are facing now, dealing with the pandemic of COVID. And we know that this is definitely impacting our folks, um, not like that of our counterparts. We also demand the freedom of political prisoners, prisons of war and political exiles. I say Harbari Ghani, Black August resistance to everyone joining us in here tonight. And so hopefully throughout the month of August, you all will be able to know what our political prisoners, prisons of war and political exiles. And tonight we will be teaching on two, Mama Nahanda and uh, Sister Asada. And then we definitely fight um, to end sexist oppression. And so those are our six organizing principles. Um, and then just do that, we are a part of the New Africans Independence Movement and a very condensed short history because um, it can be a class in itself is that the New Africans Independence Movement originated in 1968 when several hundred black nationalist delegates met at a national black uh, convening in Detroit to create the Republic of New Africa. Um, and then NAPO, our parent organization of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, New Africans People's Organization is founded in 1980, or I'm off with that, huh, Mama 74? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 74, yeah, MXGM was in, <laughs> was in 90. <laughs> and then um, from that, we, um, through building out the New Africans Women is, um, New African Women's Task Force was created to, um, combat sexism, but then also expand feminism and know that it was many more experiences that Black women often fight while trying to liberate and dealing with sexism that really coined that phrase, New African Womanism. Cool, I see the chat box lighting up, so hope you all are, <laughs> are getting to that. Brother Kwame told you 1984. Oh, thank you. Sorry, so correct this here. <laughs> Welcome, comrades, to the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Um, okay. And again, yeah, we definitely bring you uh, greetings on behalf of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement and New Africans People's Organization. Um, and thanks to those in the box and my members who are able to correct me as we go. So really quickly, again, because again, we want to get to the subject of that matter, but New African Womanism is so um, this NAWT is standing for New African Women's Task Force, was committed to addressing sexism and also bringing to the light of all the experiences that new African women um, face and experience. And by new African women, Malcolm X grassroots movement just calls black folks in the United States, new Africans. We acknowledge that there is a black nation in this US empire um, through shared experiences, culture, language. And so we, identify as new Africans and thus new African women. And so when you're looking at new African womanism, not only are we fighting off sexism based on gender, we also expanding the uh, racism based off with being black and then class classism and then also that demand for liberation. And so um, the new African women's task force was definitely committed to addressing the oftentimes sexism that Black women and leaders face in the civil rights movements and the Black power movement, which we'll dig into more deeper. Um, and we, they, because it wasn't me, <laughs> but our founders, Mama Shinganji and others, were committed to not bringing that same sexism and patriarchy and, um, into the new free nation. That was the demand. And so global male supremacy was brought up mainly impacting knowing that, yes, um, here in the United States, patriarchy existing, but there is also this global male um, 
male supremacy. I mean, we must also struggle against racial imperialism, colonialism as we move um, in all things that people and other things that seek to oppress our nation. So ultimately that just basically stands for if we are freeing the black nation and we are saying free the land and RBG, red, black and green, you must be against sexism. You must not go to repress or suppress or even oppress black women, femmes, uh, gender non-conforming um, and any other identity based off of sexuality and, and identities. And so then um, the big goal um, is that we want to fight against sex is heterosexist oppression and advance um, oppressions to be as intense on every level as a fight against racist and imperialist oppression. So again, it's no longer acting as within the feminist movement uh, in the search of women's rights. Is it you're a woman or black first or in black power movement? Are you black before being a woman? These is meaning that we need to have this um, fight to end this heterosexism and sexism um, just as intense as we do the man for the Black nation. And that's not just the role of women, that's the role of all people. Because in fact, the nation will not be free, free if we are oppressing Black women, um, gender non-conforming femmes, uh, cis and trans women. And again, this is so briefly short because I want to get to the overall of tonight um, and we can definitely um, go deep and dig in deeper and other conversations. And actually we will throughout Black August. So please give me a little grace as that was 40 years of history packed into like three or four minutes. Awesome. So excited um, to pass over the space to Mama Chinganji to speak on Nahanda. Thank you. Free the land, brothers and sisters. Um, it's an honor. It's an honor uh, for me to be able to speak about my sister this evening. I thank you, uh, Black Radical Women, for hosting this event. Thank you, panelists, my sister comrades that are here to do this teach-in. We acknowledge in advance that we don't have all the answers, but we are struggling to be free. And I wonder if... Um, my sister Taliba, if you can play the first video clip. Do you have your mic on, um, Taliba? Okay, can you all hear it now? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Never knows what tomorrow will bring. He maximizes coming to terms. Same way. Make it bigger. I can't change, but I try to make tomorrow better, and that's part of my healing process. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not think such a thing as me having to beat my ancestors. I can say, I'm sorry for the mistakes I made, but my heart was in peace. There's a part of me that says that I will go back home. Speaking, 
ones that crushed it, that my leaving had such a negative and spiritual effect on his life. What I learned on those first two weeks was that they really loved me even though we had been damaged, separated as a family. What is the saying? If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And I think that's what happened to us. Nahanda Biadun was born in activism. Her father was a devoted follower of Malcolm X and the Marcus, Honorable, Honorable Marcus Gyring. At 10 years old, she had her first exposure to activism when she participated in a protest to stop Columbia's plans for expansion that would demolish one of her favorite play spots Morningside, High, Morningside Park. The experience, the experience shaped her thinking and planted the seeds of activism. Ironically, in a, her study in journalism led her to to become many, many places throughout the city of New York. She participated and volunteered at West Harlem Community Center at the age of 13 years old. Later, she worked for several, uh, several years serving as assistant to her mentor, Margaret McNeil, the executive director and founder. Her early professional professional life included a number of roles in community-based organizations. She was a worker from the start. While all of her work was meaningful, one of the projects she was most proud of and most known for was her work with the acupuncture clinic at Lincoln Hospital. Here she joined a group of innovators and disruptors, including Dr. Matulu Shakur. And they sought treatment using acupuncture, discarding the traditional method of treatment methadone which had proven ineffective for long-term treatment. This radical approach to treatment was transformative and recognized nationally. Her work continued at Bana and the first acupuncture clinic, Bana was the Black Acupuncture Association of North America 
and it was the first acupuncture clinic in Harlem. In the 70s, Nahanda's commitment to social justice intensified in response to a growing stream of violence and injustice inflicted upon black and brown people. It was common to see her at protests and rallies with her two children, especially her son, Hakima. She loved her children fiercely and her maternal instincts to protect them and create a better world were the core of her decision to live the life of a revolutionary. She was a founding member of the New African People's Organization and an organizer for the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Nahanda was forced underground and into exile from her home after being charged for alleged criminal activity and involvement, including the Brinks expropriation. And now I'd like to, to go into just like some of my personal insights, which will share in particular the work that Nahanda did around women and dealing with uh, sexism and sexist oppression. I met Nahanda Biadun close to 40 years ago. As I remember, we were both political activists and we were formulating an organization called the New African Women's Organization. This was a precursor to the New African People's Organization, which brought together activists with the same political ideology, revolutionary nationalism, and strategy, self-determination. NAWO was being formed to address and struggle with the many issues facing our women, sexism, violence against women, economic disparity, et cetera. NAWO is now the New African Womanist Task Force, of which I'm a proud member. I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and we had invited a representative from New York to speak at our annual International Women's Day program. Nahanda came as a representative. On a personal note, we didn't hit it off at first, but we respected each other and we had work to do. It was through this work that we built a sisterhood like no other. A sister, a sister activist once told me after Nahanda was forced underground, why do you all try to portray Nahanda as the star, this diva, when her strength in the movement comes from her work in the streets, a regular sister? I learned the truth of this assessment and I appreciated it. Nahanda taught me the value of being a regular sister. She was a sister to all people and greeted, greeted every person with smile and love. She also became Mama Nia to the many young people she took under her wing and mentored and guided in activism. Her personality allowed her to stay free. She often talked about meeting people that weren't activists or even woke as they say today, but respected her and her movement and asked what could they do. As stated, Nahanda was forced underground after the 1981 Brinks expropriation attempt. Several of her comrades were captured or killed. In 1987, I was honored to be invited to Cuba to interview Asada Shakur after publishing of her book, Asada, the Autobiography. The New African People's Organization had endorsed the book. I was honored to do this. I met Asada and I was able to reconnect with my sister Nahanda. During this trip and many others over the years, I was able to witness two sisters joined in exile of the same struggle, work to build sisterhood. That mutual goal was to promote the new African liberation movement, internationalize our struggle, raise awareness of many political prisoners and prisoners of war in the US and to be in solidarity with their host, the Cuban government. I watched and learned from these two sisters, completely different, the importance of using your gifts and personalities to build unity. I learned the value of sacrifice and discipline my respect for their sacrifices are immense. They have both left their families, but continue to struggle even though they were sad and lonely sometimes. Both New Yorkers, they miss that flavor of New York, but they continue to carry it on. I learned the value of discipline and responsibility to our movement. The New African Women's Task Force have been launched. And so we asked Sister Nahanda to create a conversation with the FMC, the Federation of Cuban Women. We were able to sponsor several roundtable conferences with the new African and Cuban women. We discussed our similarities, struggles, and victories. The FMC then invited us to participate in the International 
Women's Conference. And we had several New African women present on various panels and workshops. There were also several breakout sessions for dialogue. By doing so, we were able to learn from each other's movement and build international support for our political prisoners and prisoners of war. Under Nahanda's guidance, the New African Women's Task Force went on to build campaigns to support the women of Cuba. We provided items such as tampons, hair products, and underwear. They don't seem important to us who have complete access, but for the Cuban women, they were honored to have these products and to have them for free. Nahanda Isoki Abiyadum made her transition on January 30th, 2019. Her dream was to return home as a free woman. Instead, she passed in her second home, Cuba. The blessing is that she was never captured. She is an ancestor. She is a free woman. She is the daughter of Oshun and she watches over us. I don't think my other clip is um, accessible. So I may try to come back later to that because I talk some about the um, hip hop. Awesome, Ashe, thank you, Marching Ganji. Um, and so I'm passing it over to my comrade, Daraja, to bring in um, Sister Asada. Free to land, everybody. I just want to say before I start talking about Asada, I'm just so blessed to be here. Like, I just feel like every time I hear like one of the elders just talk about their stories, I always hear something new. So even though I've heard Mama Changanji share about her relationship with Nahanda, I feel like I still learn something new. So I'm just always blessed to be in spaces with elders. I'm really blessed to be with my comrades and then with all of the wonderful participants today. So just thank you all, I'm really excited. Um, so Asada Shakur. So for many people who are just coming into movement space, I feel like one of the, the main touch points of Asada is what is now known as her Asada chant. So it's here on the screen, some of you may know it, but it says, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And so a lot of times people chant this at rallies, at protests, and I understand why. It's like very, very powerful. But I often wonder if people really know who the person of Asada is. Like what is her work? What is her history? What is her political ideology? And so I just wanna share a clip with you all. Um, it's the next slide, Saliba. And in this clip, this is a letter that Asada wrote to Pope John Paul II when he visited Cuba in 1998. And here she really shares her story, she shares her work, and she shares her ideology. And I figure y'all can hear it straight from Asada who she is. Taliba, you have to unmute. extradition. My name is Asada Shakur, and I was born and raised in the United States. I am a descendant of Africans who were kidnapped and brought to the Americas as slaves. I spent my early childhood in the racist segregated South. I later moved to the northern part of the country where I realized that black people were equally victimized by racism and oppression. I grew up and became a political activist, participating in student struggles, the anti-war movement, and most of all, in the movement for the liberation of African Americans in the United States. I later joined the Black Panther Party, an organization that was targeted by the COINTELPRO program, a program that was set up by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to eliminate all political opposition to the U.S. government's policies, to destroy the Black liberation movement in the United States, to discredit activists, 
and to eliminate potential leaders. Under the COINTELPRO program, many political activists were harassed, imprisoned, murdered, or otherwise neutralized. As a result of being targeted by COINTELPRO, I, like many other young people, were faced with the threat of prison, underground, exile, or death. The FBI, with the help of local police agencies, systematically fed false accusations and fake news articles to the press, accusing me and other activists of crimes we did not commit. Although in my case, the charges were eventually dropped or I was eventually acquitted, the national and local police agencies created a situation where based on their false accusations against me, any police officer could shoot me on sight. It was not until the Freedom of Information Act was passed in the mid-70s that we began to see the scope of the United States government persecution of political activists. At this point, I think that it is important to make one thing very clear. I have advocated and I still advocate revolutionary changes in the structure and in the principles that govern the United States. I advocate self-determination for my people and for all oppressed people inside the United States. I advocate an end to capitalist exploitation, the abolition of racist policies, the eradication of sexism, and the elimination of political repression. If that is a crime, then I am totally guilty. To make a long story short, I was captured in New Jersey in 1973 after being shot with both arms held in the air and then shot again from the back. I was left on the ground to die, and when I did not, I was taken to a local hospital where I was threatened, beaten, and tortured. In 1977, I was convicted in a trial that can only be described as a legal lynching. In 1979, I was able to escape with the aid of some of my fellow comrades. I saw this as a necessary step, not only because I was innocent of the charges against me, but because I knew that the racist legal system in the United States, I would receive no justice. I was also afraid that I would be murdered in prison. I later arrived in Cuba, where I am currently living in exile as a political refugee. The New Jersey State Police and other law enforcement officials say they want to see me brought to justice. But I would like to know what they mean by justice. Is torture justice? I was kept in solitary confinement for more than two years, mostly in men's prisons. Is that justice? My lawyers were threatened with imprisonment and imprisoned. Is that justice? I was tried by an all-white jury without even the pretext of impartiality and has been sentenced to life in prison for 33 years. Is that justice? Let me emphasize that justice for me is not the issue I am addressing here. It is justice for my people that is at stake. When my people receive justice, I am sure that I will receive it too. I want to apologize. My, um, my camera went out. So with all the virtual meetings and working from home, my camera is just not lasting the way it used to. Um, and I'm like resisting putting on like my teacher hat and saying, what did you all get from that video? But um, I know we're going to have question and answers at the end. Um, but I hope that what you got from that is really um, the revolutionary politic of Asada. Like she was very, very clear about what her crimes are. Her crimes are that she wants self-determination for her people. She wants the end of racism, the end of sexism, 
um, the end of capitalism and the end of political repression. Um, and so the words that are a part of what we now call the Asada chant, it actually comes from a letter that Asada wrote two months after the altercation on the New Jersey State Turnpike. And so when we chant those words, we really need to remember that they are grounded in a revolutionary politic, um, that they're grounded in um, self-determination for Black people. They're not grounded in sort of like reformist movements. They're not really grounded in just trying to change the system or have Black people kind of move up within this system. So I just wanted to highlight that. Another thing that many times people don't know about Asada is that she had some really interesting things to say about racism. Um, so I have a few quotes here that come directly from Asada um, where she really describes her own um, experiences in movement um, and the sexism that she faced. So she says, I was socialized to be timid. Women were not supposed to get up in front of crowds so when we see strong women who are whole, you know, strong sisters and revolutionary struggles, you know what they went through. It wasn't just that they were privileged. They didn't go through what men went through. Men go through half of what women go through to become effective leaders because it's easier for their work to be recognized because other men are anxious to recognize their work. When I started becoming active in political organizations, men were not anxious to recognize my work. They were anxious to recognize my body. Women are not educated to be the leader, but you are educated to go to bed with the leader. The image, and actually, I can't actually see the bottom. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I need to make my screen bigger. Let me see. If you make your screen bigger, it's definitely gonna work. Okay, all right. So you have to go back, Saliva. Okay. Yeah, I still don't see it on my screen. <laughs> um, for some reason, it's like, yeah, it just stops at the image for mine. It's like my screen maybe not be big enough. What was the last thing you read? I can read the last part. Um, everything, so they were anxious to recognize my body Women are not educated to be the leader, but you are educated to go to bed with the leader and then the part after that. The image of the male leader was always oh. Okay, thank you. You can go to the next one. Okay. Sisters were the most efficient people in almost all of the organizations that I worked with and for, and were also the most neglected, unlistened to, people of all the organizations that I worked with and were also the most powerless people in all of the organizations that I worked with. We had a totally male dominated political structure, a political style, but we also had a very male oriented way of relating to each other. Who cares if you have cramps? Don't nobody wanna hear about your babies. Don't, no wanna, don't nobody wanna hear about your babysitter or your lack of babysitters or anything else. You're supposed to be at the meeting. Nobody is concerned about dinner. Where did it come from? It's supposed to come from you. And it doesn't, and if it doesn't come from you, then you know you got to fight not to be in the kitchen. So I shared those words of Asada because again, it's, it's something that we don't always recognize, these words that she shared. Even in her, um, her autobiography, she does even talk briefly about how she was married for like little under a year and her and her husband had to split because of the sexism that she was facing even there. So I think it's really interesting that these words that Asada wrote likely in like the early 70s are coming around the same time that you have the Kambahi River Collective statement where Black women are saying we struggle with Black men against racism, but we're also struggling with Black men about sexism. And then if you like fast forward, and I think somebody mentioned this in the comments already, then you have like Kimberly Crenshaw in 89, she's talking about intersectionality and how we have these intersectional oppressions, these interlocking oppressions where we can't just say, oh, let's just focus on race or, oh, let's just focus on sexism or let's just focus on capitalism or heterosexism that we really have to, um, as black people, look at how 
all of these different oppressions are impacting us. And then here we are in 2020, and in many ways, we are still dealing with a lot of the same things that our elders spoke of many years ago. Um, so I just wanted to also share those words with Asada, of, of Asada. Um, and also just, I never had the opportunity to meet Asada. I would love to, just putting that out in the universe. Um, mm -hmm. But I first encountered her work when I was an undergrad. And um, I actually saw the documentary Eyes of the Rainbow first, and then that led me to go into her autobiography. But something interesting that Mama Chinganji said today that really struck her about Nahanda and how she was just this regular sister, that's what I got from reading Asada's autobiography. Like, I just really, like in my mind sometimes, revolutionaries like Nahanda and Asada, they're like superheroes. Like, they have like superpowers or something. Like, I could never be like that. But then when I read her autobiography, I just realized that she was a regular person who just made a commitment. You know, she made a commitment to movement. She made a commitment to the liberation of her people. And that's really all that we have to do to be Asada and to be Nahanda is to every day wake up with that commitment and do that work. So I just wanted to share that. I hope that that was really helpful. Um, I'm Mama Chinganji, do you want to add anything? And maybe Taliba too, because I know that y'all actually had the privilege of meeting Asada. <laughs> Uh, I do want to add something. Um, she was a regular sister, you know, um, <laughs> and and it's it's my honor that I did get a chance to meet her. Um, but one of the things I always remember that whenever I would make one of my many trips, uh, what she wanted to know was what was the latest slang, you know, what were people <laughs> and she and she would try and pick it up like right away and try and use it, and then. Um, both her and uh, Nahanda always wanted to know what dance was out. So, yes. you know, the, the thing, one of the, my, one of my treasured memories of both of them is that we would work, literally work all day, you know, um, and then, but at night we go out and have some fun and, mm -hmm. uh, and enjoy, you know, just enjoy, um, work hard, play hard. And uh, like I said, both of them, um, that was like one of my honored memories of being able to experience that with them. You know, unfortunately, right now, I, you know, my heart goes out to um, Sister Asada because she's not able to, to be out and about um, anymore mm -hmm. because of the bounty on her head and the, yeah. the kind of conditions with people in and out, you know. So um, unfortunately, I haven't been able, to, you know, in the last few trips that, that I've been, when I've been there, I haven't been able to, um, see her you know but um but yeah so she she like you were saying the regular sister both of them regular mm -hmm. sisters that and which which i appreciate because that means everybody's an activist there is mm -hmm. no star there is no diva there's no when i hear people say now that uh where are the leaders we're all leaders mm -hmm. we're all leaders, you sure. know and and the the things that they had to do to attack sexism at the time that they had to, just phenomenal work, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. One of my um, my friends and one of the members of the Philly chapter, she said that uh, when she met Asada, the one of one of the things that she um, saw right away, she's a really really good spades player. So like like you said, at nighttime they would have fun. That's what they did. She said they played spades and she was like, oh, she is a really good spades player. So I just love like those stories of, again, like these people that we kind of, you know, lift up in our minds as heroes. And they are, they definitely are because of the work they put in. But at the same time, they are regular people. So I love that. Um, so just to conclude this portion, I did want to share um, a poem that was written by Asada. This is called The Tradition. And it's performed by a poet um, by the name of Mama Roots. The Tradition, a poem by Asada Shakur. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of time who carried it on. In Ghana and Mali and Timbuktu, we carried it on. We carried on the tradition. 
We hid in the bush when the slave masters came, holding spear, and when the moment was ripe, leaped out and lanced the lifeblood of our would-be captors. We carried it on. On slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, we slit the throats of our captors. We took their whips and their ships. Blood flowed in the Atlantic, and it wasn't all ours. We carried it on. Fed Missy, arsenic apple pies, stole axes from the shed, went and chopped off master's head. We ran, we fought, we organized a railroad, an underground. We carried it on. In newspapers, in meetings, in arguments, and street fights, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants and cantantas, in poems and blues songs and saxophone screams, we carried it on. On soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment lines, our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins and pray-ins and march-ins and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri nights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs. On burning Baltimore streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on. Against water hoses and bulldogs, against nightsticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique and Mississippi, in Brazil and in Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through the pain and hunger and frustration, we carried it on. Carried on a tradition, carried on a strong tradition, a proud tradition, carried a black tradition, carry it on and pass it down. Pass it down to the children, pass it down. Carry it on now. Carry it on to freedom. Gotta stay. Gotta look at So timely. Can I um make say one thing, um, Chaliba, before we go to the next portion? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is one of the questions in the chat or one of the comments in the chat that um, there are several people who had never heard of Nahanda prior to her passing. And some one person mentioned that prior to this teaching, um, the advertisement for the teaching, and it's because she didn't want as much attention as um, was given to Asada. Cause that the information is important. The knowledge that to know what they did and the sacrifice that they made, but the repression is real. The repression is real. And um, so, there was some conscious decisions on her part not to take that kind of a public stand, even though she she worked really hard and and, and should be acknowledged for her sacrifices as well. Mm -hmm. And that's really, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I think that that's um, I know you're still going, Darasia, but I think that's just one of those lessons that we should carry on as we continue to do this work, especially as repression and technology mm -hmm. is ever advancing. Um, and we won't even know how we are being repressed until something either, you know, where the underground and then we understand that COINTELPRO is a thing that's happening or mm -hmm. it's way too late. So thanks for bringing up that practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that. Oh. Well, the transition was already into carry on the lessons. I was ready to throw it. Was, it. Carry it on. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. No, you see what I did. You see what I did. <laughs> I, see, I see. Okay, great. Um, and I just got to get it back full screen. So uh, free to land every... Well, I know what I need to do. Free to land, everyone. Again, I'm Taliba Obuya. And definitely are bringing continued greetings from the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Um. And I am really excited to be in this space with you all and everyone who is here, although can't physically see you, but I definitely see the chat box going off. And again, I do hope that this allows us to just dig further and deeper into some of these examples, some of these um, people who can give us directions. And so we wanted to highlight um, some key lessons that we can take away both from Amna Honda and Sister Asada um, 
and that we can continue to do this work since we are carrying it on and being in that um, Black radical tradition of resistance. And so um, these were just some images to also note that like, while again, we won't know all of their works unless we are intentional, unless we have access to ancestors and that resource that can share us of that workings. But knowing that at the end of the day, these two women chose to fight on behalf of our people and fight for liberation. And um, like Darajah was saying, and I, I can be like, ooh, that's me. I, I can so romanticize and not really from like, oh, it must have been easy, but one of those things of like, A, it's really necessary because what they were doing in the 70s is necessary now, 30 years later. And then two, it wasn't just something they could do and then turn off at 5 p.m. Like there is some commitments and pieces there. And so one of our first two lessons that we wanted to lift up was self-determination. And so as I just stated, that chant of it is our duty um, is a part of a letter that Asada writes after um, her capture. And in that, not only is she apologizing, she's also stating why it was necessary. And as we saw and heard with her own words, that it is a demand for self-determination. And when we say that, that's like a collective term. It's the self-determination at minimum Black people should have the right to determine and be in control of their lives. And so if we are in majority or we are in <laughs> these worlds, we should be in control. And what does that look like? And then also consistency. And the reason why that one was shared um, is because ultimate goal being self-determination, we're definitely going to need that consistency. And so for us to be uh, generations on in into the new Africans independence movement, I know I've asked several political prisoners and political exiles as Mama Nahanda, like, what was it? Like, what's that magic ingredient? What do I need to do? And it was really consistency. Like, we need to become predictable. Um, you should be able, if, if you say that you're going to do something, they know it's done. Um, even we celebrated Baba Chukwe's birthday, August 2nd, and I remember he would ask me to do things, and then I would find out he asked other people, and I'm like, why? You asked me, but it was one of those things is like that consistency, and when you continue, people already know if it's asked, it's done. Um, the next piece was, hey, yeah, was community. Um, and with community, we know that both uh, Sister Asada and Mama Nahanda, um, and they both could be Mama Asada and Nahanda, Sister Nahanda, um, but just in what I used to calling them, um, community. And this was like both ends. Like one, the work, like they became political exiles because they were grounded in community and grounded in the work. And so Sister Nahanda worked with um, Matulu Shakur, a current political prisoner in the United States, um, within the Heron um, clinics. And so they were using acupuncture to relieve the addiction of heroin and methadone that was gripping our communities and to like liberate them in that way. And then also community of comrades that even when Asada um, what survived the New Jersey Turnpike because it wasn't that she was meant to be. She was shot twice, instantly paralyzed and then also left to die on the asphalt as she says in her words. Um, she was incarcerated, solitary confinement, almost two years. She was able to get liberated from that um, situation due to her comrades coming to her aid. Her as a black woman with all of her struggles was seen as the heart of the movement and she needed to be um, liberated. And so through um, precision, I hit the, I'm trying to use the words the elders when they speak of the story, but they were able to run that and no one was harmed. She was free. And then she showed up in Cuba, liberated. And so community is there big. Um, and then I have sacrifice here and then a line through it because I just remember a conversation with Mama Nahanda. Again, I'm just talking late, um, had the opportunity to meet her on a trip to Cuba. And um, and she was like, uh, I was just like, so what is it? Like, how do you feel about this sacrifice? Like, is there regret there? Because again, these were organizers who saw something wrong, was committed to it, made that. Um, and I, I saw it as a sacrifice. You're in exile in Cuba now. And even with Mama Chinganji, it was, this, it was intentional not to be known for the work. Um, mm -hmm. People didn't really like know her for this work, but she's exiled in Mama Nahanda was a mom. Like her two kids, Mama Chinganji brought them into the space. 
Um, and so, but she corrected me quickly and was like, it wasn't a sacrifice. It was a commitment. And I knew that fighting and the demanding self-determination for our people, loving our people, that this could have been a consequence. I knew that our sister needed to be liberated and we did it what was necessary to liberate her. And so um, I say that to be, we don't want to romanticize it. Like this is the thing that we're just going to go and get into. Um, and your activism and your organizing again, doesn't have to even be at the level or same lane. That's not what we are advocating for, but knowing that it might be sacrifices in other ways. Like if we really are moving anti-imperialistic, what does that look like to challenge capitalism? And we really are moving um, in anti-heterosexist ways, then what does that mean to challenge some of our culture, beliefs, the ways we are socialized and things like that. So just wanted to lift up sacrifice, but not seeing it as a sacrifice, but yet that commitment to um, organizing and movement. Great, so we're at call to action. I just feel like we missed one, but I guess I didn't. Okay, great. Awesome, Sister Salika. All right, all right, Freedom Land family. I hope everyone is doing well. First off, I want to say, Mama Chinganji, thank you so much for your words. Um, they were beautiful, but also I think not only did like the public learn something as your comrades and as your daughters, we also learned something. So thank you so much for just sharing that information. Um, I'll be taking a lot um, from that. Um, Ia Darasia, for those of you who don't know, that's my godmother. So <laughs> that's why I refer to her as such. Um, thank you so much for your words and also kind of giving us these lessons on Asada, particularly during a time period where we see um, names being commodified through hashtags. In one sense, hashtags are a, a great way to memorialize people or to elevate people or to bring awareness to people. Um, but in the same breath, we know that hashtags um, also have a neoliberal function that I think that we need to recognize and not ignore when we're talking about digital public spaces. Um, so we have to understand that social media spaces like Twitter, other spaces where we use hashtags are still colonial tools. Um, we've just figured out ways as organizers and as activists and, and just the people to wield social media in other ways. So thank you so much for being bringing clarity um, to uh, someone like um, Asada and someone like Mama Nahanda. Taliba, thank you so much for also getting us um, on track and talking about some of those um, demand things like that. So one of the things that I'm gonna, by the way, everyone, I'm Zalika, pronouns, um, she, her. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here, but I wanna get into some of the demands and also uh, the call to action. This is not just something um, just for our comrades, but this is also something that we hope that even those of you who are watching, who are just a part of the people, are able to uh, take away from and work with us. So the first thing, you can go to the next slide, Taliba. So the first part um, we want to talk about, so we got a little bit of the history. Um, for starters, Mama Chinganji, um, Taliba, and yeah, Derasia, all gave us aspects of the history. I think um, this is something that we wanted to really, really address. And this is something I'm gonna say. So we must be willing to critique the cisgender and heterosexual and often masculinist approaches to black revolutionary struggle. And um, what I also wanna highlight within the same breath is that um, there also must be a sort of um, acknowledgement um, to analyze the deliberate erasure of the revolutionary nationalist work of black women and queer folks who are dedicated to a black feminist and womanist frame of thought. I think just as much as it's important for us to talk about those sexisms, um, the massage and war, uh, the transphobia and the queerphobia, we need not all to contribute to the erasure of those black women and queer folk who did that revolutionary work. It is important that we recognize them and identify them, say them by name, and also understand um, the history. Uh, Black women have been here doing the work forever. 
Black queer folks have been doing the, here, doing the work forever. These are things that we should not be negating. So I think once again, we must be willing to not only critique, but we also must be willing to expose and um, un unveil those absences and speak to those gaps um, in the archive, so to speak, because I think that's part of it too. The archive is something that can be tampered with, meaning that sometimes we choose who we want to historically represent. But I think today is a great demonstration of the ways that um, Mama Chinganji, Taliba, Ia Dereja are, are um, unmasking and uncovering those histories. Um, the second action that we're, we're calling a call to action is to have a gender and sexual politics of care. Um, so with that said, um, we're saying um, we must maintain a living being in Black gender and sexual politics to aid in Black freedom struggle. And when I say uh, a living and breathing uh, Black gender and sexual politics, I literally mean something that as we go along, that we understand 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and 50 years ago, we went through various um, revolutionary periods. I think um, this is something that Huey P. Newton has talked about and others have talked about. Some of the things that we may not consider revolutionary for the period or to the period today were in fact and indeed revolutionary to those time periods. So with that said, we need to make sure that we are very willing and ready to, to make those, those advancements, to um, add to those politics. So for example, the Kambahi River Collective Statement was written decades ago, however, this organization of wonderful black queer uh, radical uh, feminists have made some updates to the work that they're doing. In the same vein, MXGM is also committed to the same kinds of works. We acknowledge um, the, the sexism, we acknowledge the heterosexism, we acknowledge the transphobia, the massage and war. However, we are committed to creating or developing a politic that is constantly on the move and growing um, as the years go by. And we cannot do that without the help of the people. This is why we have to be in community with one another. This is why over the years, MXGM has also had a history of um, surveying the people, working with the people, um, collecting data from the people to understand what are some of the most pressing issues that community members are facing. Oh, and, and fun fact. Um, so I remember a few years ago, you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with the 20, every 28 hours uh, statistic that many other organizations such as BLM and others have used. MXGM, surprise, also did some of that work and some of that research. So I wanted to elevate that to show you all that this is the work that we've actually been committed to doing. Um, so the next thing after that, in addition to having the sort of black gender and sexual politic that we're committed to having grow and um, adding to is also as a third point, a dedication to study. Now, I know so many of you are probably interacting on social media or you're talking to your peers off of social media. And one of the things that people will often say is y'all don't read, right? However, MXGM, or as these new African womanists, we're also adhering um, to a sense of study. And we, we, we recognize this, like we, there must be a consistent dedication to study, but a particular study that aids in various creative expressions of learning. With that said, so one of the things today that we're, we're also learning as we're doing some of these workshops too, is, you know, we understand that there are people with disabilities. So maybe learning, I'm trying to add subtitles to those kinds of things. Um, another thing we wanna talk about as well is um, in aiding the various styles and recognizing that listening to speeches, reading speeches, um, study doesn't just mean reading books or reading Twitter threads. It's also about um, using the visual aids. Um, visual art can facilitate a uh, part of that. Sometimes movement, some of the things that people are doing um, in other ways could also aid in study. So I think any way that someone is willing to learn, we must be willing to make those accommodations and do that work to um, accommodate to uh, various in all forms of learning as well. And as a fourth and final um, point in terms of our call to action, um, even though we have many other sort of calls, 
um, is a commitment to revolutionary struggle. As Black feminists and womanists, we are committed to revolutionary struggle and demand an end to genocide um, and any threat against all of our people. This means that we're not just here trying to fight for cisgender heterosexual uh, populations of Black folk or African folk across the diaspora or on the continent. We're also committed um, to the struggle of also um, demanding an end to all forms of oppression, even um, the, the those who have advanced marginalizations. And when we say advanced marginalizations, we're talking about people who aren't just dealing with racism. We're talking about people who are dealing with racism, possibly um, transphobia, queerphobia, um, ableism, whorephobia, all those kinds of things. We're here to uh, aid in destroying all of those things. Right now in MXGM and in the New African Women's Task Force and other things, we're also working on other things such as a New African Womanist Collective, where we're trying to make sure that we're gaining an understanding of the needs of the people. And we're gonna be doing the work really to understand what exactly are some of the most pressing issues. So although we're here to come with solutions, we're also here to address problems. We're also here to um, aid in trying to take care of one another, love one another, trying to make sure that we have community and building home for one another. So I'm really, really um, excited for the work uh, that we are doing as new African womanists and the work to come. And we're also just welcoming you to be in community with us as well. We're getting some of your information information. We know that some of you have expressed interest and we're so excited to do this work with you all. Clearly we're not perfect and that is okay, but at the same time we're dedicated to this work and there's just been so much groundwork and foundational work that has been laid by folk like Mama Chinganji, Mama Nahanda, um, Mama Asada, and, and various other Black women and even queer folks who have done this work. So we really want to just welcome you to like join us to do that work with us. So thank you. Well, yes, thank you, sis, with that. Sorry, I was trying to see if we could have our clip from earlier play. Um, that's why I keep looking over to the right. Um, but yeah, so as we try to come back to that and then prepare to kind of open up for conversation, and discussion, we definitely wanted to share ways about staying connected to Malcolm X grassroots movement. As uh, Salika shared, we, um, and as Mama Chinganji shared, um, we are committed to principal struggle, to ever growing um, and advancing and reflecting what is needed for our nation to ultimately be free. So follow us on the social medias, MXGM National, um, check out our awesome new fresh website, the um, beautiful expression by our sister Daraja. Um, and then um, and then I believe our personal socials were shared out. So that's there or no, we have another slide with those pieces here. So, um, so I'll leave those there. I do see a few questions now in the kiosk for that part. Um, Cool, Mama Shinganji, if you got it and reshare it, I can definitely play it. Oh, yeah, you like the slide. Thank you. I'm I sorry. Just, I'm, I'm but, working on it, Talib. I'll, 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 I'll just gonna, take some I'll, questions and then um, I'll see if I can get it up and I'll signal okay. you if I get it. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'll look at there from Alex. I'm so grateful for the generosity of presenters. Is there Vimos I can use to compensate for that education? Um, that's so awesome. The fundraiser me, I'm like, yes, um, MXGM, ATL <laughs> is our cash app. But also um, definitely would wonder what chapter, you're, what city you're in, you can join a chapter, become a member. The Malcolm X Grassroots Movement is definitely a grassroots organization, we're not nonprofit. And so um, that is helpful. And it's also at the same time, Black August. So if you all know any political prisoners or y'all can look them up and send some money their way, that will be greatly appreciated. Um, 
currently we are definitely demanding the freedom for Baba Matulu Shakur, who is currently incarcerated. Um, and he also was a um, co-defendant with Mama Nahanda um, on the allegation of liberating Sister Asada. Um, and so, yes, um, Matulu Shakur. Matu, sister, Darius, what's the website? Matu Shakur is welcome here. I think it's matushakur.com. I can look it up. I'm actually yeah, going to put yeah, that in the side. Thank in the, um, you. Chat. Okay, cool. Can you talk about the hip hop connection? Yes. Yeah, so Mama Chigan just putting the clip together. Um, but I was able to meet. So Mama Nahanda is known as the grandmother of hip hop in Cuba. Um hip hop was brought to the island through Black August. I mean, so usually during the month of Black August is a commemorative month is why we say like Habari Ghani. It's not per se like happy Black August, but it was a moment where we were using this to um, be in solidarity with those incarcerated who had took on fasting from sun up to sundown. They went and participate in the commissaries. I um, mean, it was really just to lift up the struggles that are happening behind the walls. Um, and at the same time, be in discipline. So they would fast, they would study, um, they would train, and then their resistance was form of fighting. Uh, thank you for sharing those out. Um, and so essentially our New York chapter would do a Black August concert where we could like do a whole, like almost like Fela style, was hip hop, but they would stop, they would teach on um, our PPs that were like locked down, be able to use that concert to raise money for political prisoners. Um, and then in conversations with Nahanda, she was like, you should bring it down to the island. Like hip hop could be a source of organizing young people, organizing up the people um, to like really own and fight for what they want, like through culture. Um, and so they did an international hip hop concert in Cuba um, and then several more. And I was able to, um, I was able to what, um, meet her during the 15th year anniversary of having hip hop on the island. And from there, it was like literally artists from like all over, um, from Belize and um, Ecuador, Cuba, of course, uh, United States, Mexico, um, the Caribbean, literally like all over, um, black and brown, Afro, artists just out there having a good time um and they definitely like contribute that to like the work that uh, mama Nahanda was doing on the island but then also connecting both struggles and seeing cuba as an ally and a partner to the liberation of the black nation that is in this u.s empire cool so um anyone want to take it salika how important is pan-africanism to Black people struggle in your opinion or anyone on panel. And I can step back, son. Are you there? It's good scroll up. Say it again. How important is pan Africanism to Black people struggle in your opinion? In, your, in my opinion. Okay, so. One of the things that I think um, that would be necessary to really, really interrogate and explore um, is sort of this, there are a lot of misconceptions about Pan-Africanism. Um, and, you know, we can address like some of the elephants in the room too. I think some of it has a lot to do um, with the confusion that there are actually multiple identities within Pan-Africanist uh, ideologies. So it's not just one singular identity even though um, there is a sort of common understanding and goal. So for example, we are, we identify as revolutionary nationalists um, within a sort of pan-African context. I think in most recent years, what has happened um, is, you know, there are a series of people who uh, sort of make these claims. Um, they use um, cultural um, aesthetics to uh, sort of posture themselves as Pan-African. And I think a lot of folk would refer to these people as what do they call them, hoteps or something like that. Um, but the hotep in the way that we're, a lot of you talk about- maybe it, we can 
say like no tip since hotep is a real yeah, concept. I say, I say no tip, but you know that they say hotep. So right. we don't, you know, face the <laughs> music here. So yeah, we say um, no tips or sometimes faux tips um, is another one. But in regard to, oh, hey, Baba Makungu, I, I see you. Are you about to answer the question? Right. Um, but what I'll say is, I think as we're talking about a sort of pan African identity, it's, it's, um, it's best to note one, the, the revolutionary tenets of it, um, and even some of the socialist tenets of it as well. I think that pan African identity is something that's often wielded as something that is overly cultural, but people have to understand there's a reason why we don't even identify as cultural nationalists. Um, this is why we identify as revolutionary nationalists. So with um, Pan-African identity, one, it actually centers diaspora. So we're not just focused just on the United States, which is why you see some of this transnational work um, that Mama Chinganji and others have spoken to, whether it be Cuba, whether it be Brazil, whether it be the United States. Um, some of you are literally in the group chat um, from the UK. Um, some of you are in other parts of the world. I think it's important to acknowledge that that is part of the Pan-Africanist politic um, as we're trying to end multiple forms of oppression. So I think this is, and in, in, in the work that we do, this is something that I think uh, that Pan-Africanism speaks to. It's not just a cultural nationalist movement. This is not just about aesthetics. This is not for us just about wearing dashikis, although they can look nice and, and, and nice earrings and things like this, but this is about serious revolutionary work, a serious commitment to struggle. Yes, Mama Chinganji, you on mute. Hold on a second, let me see if I can unmute you. No, Mama Chinganji, you on mute. Okay, I'm gonna try, if you can take away your screen share, I'm gonna try and share my screen and see if that video will play. Okay. Well, it's so, while Mama Chingaji brings it up, um, I can say that there is another question, what are some ways you are making sure your movement is not centered around cisgendered heteronormative ideas or leadership. So again, um, the Malcolm X grassroots movement is a part of the New Africans Independence Movement, um, which was a movement we were born and birthed into. Okay, cool, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll come back to that question. All right. Who is Mahanda Isoki Abiyadu? Why should we support her? Uh, Mahanda is a freedom fighter. And let me tell you, that she was never captured. Honda is a former member of Republican Africa, a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, who has been doing significant human rights work uh, for all of her adult life. The Honda Abiy Odun was walking down 125th Street when she found out about the raids and that the comrades were being swooped up. She stood there and turned around and walked down those subway steps and went underground. And she was a black woman. Um, she was not a wealthy woman, but she was able to find her way from the A train at 125th Street safely to the beaches of Havana, Cuba. And one would think that after going through all that to get to where she was, that she would just take a vacation. However, that was not what she did because as a freedom fighter, as a revolutionary, Nahanda believed that you, wherever you go, you have to work. So the first thing she did was she made contact with the many medical students that were in Cuba getting a free medical education. And her job, she felt, and I agree, was to teach them that once they got their medical degrees, once they became doctors, they had to take those skills back into the community. Her job was to make them connected to the many communities that they were going back to. She put them in touch with freedom fighters she, that were political prisoners and prisoners of war. They set up pen pals uh, with them. She made them visit them. She made them call 
them when they came home and she made them make that connection as to what work they would need to do. The many things that she gave them as tasks were the things that she was unable to do, but that she had been taught to do as a freedom fighter. She set up study groups inside her home. In a small Havana community, she became well known as the new African princess because she realized the importance of organizing where you are. Not only that, as she became connected to the many young people in Cuba, that they were beginning a hip hop movement. And they came to her for guidance because she knew that they knew that she had connections with Tupac Shakur. So what she did was she helped them to legitimize themselves as hip hop artists and put them in touch with the many hip hop artists that she knew. What they did was they set up a Black August hip hop movement. Primarily, the Black August Hip Hop Project raises funds and awareness for political prisons in the United States. And we raise awareness about political prisons globally. And one of the ways that we do it is by having a concert, a benefit concert locally. So through Black August, we've traveled with artists to Cuba, to South Africa, to Tanzania, to Brazil, and to Venezuela, and had exchanges with activists there and artists there just to figure out how they're doing things and how we can learn from what we're doing. But the primary place that the Black August Hip Hop Project started going to was Cuba. And Cuba's the foundation because of the relationship that Cuba has to our political prisoners in the United States. I have 32 counts of this, which includes the mutilation of the foundation. Okay. Um, expropriation. Um, transporting arms and monies across the state. Like I said, it's 32 of them. A lot of them are interviewing. It is not enough for me to say that just my comrades will help me to be free so that I will not be captured. It was an effort by our whole community. It was a picture of me being able to get here and not be captured of our people. And I say that because it's that people that helped me when I was under the Indian United States do just not hold up hope. You have to get the revolution that there were grandmothers who do not even understand my line in terms of land as independent, but said to me, you do something for black people and I got help. Going to be unsung heroes and sheroes, but we have so many fighters who say, I love black people and I'm a commit full heart of me. And Mama Nahami just wasn't someone who did the work so that she would know her name. She wasn't someone who did the work because she got a lot of thanks and accolades um, for the sacrifices that she did. Um, she was loving black people in action, still fighting for black people while in the exile. She was a mom though, she was a daughter, she was a sister. And those like was heavyweights that she she held and she honored, but then she also was a foot soldier for the people. And so she's important to know because although we and many of us did not honor her in the way that we were able to while she was um, living on this plane, we know that she still has an ancestor still fighting for us. So with honor your mama and Honda and her transition allows for. Thank you for sharing that and bringing that back. And so I hope that you all are able to my tech, not tech, technology person over here. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I'm happy we was able to come through. And we can uh, definitely for the things that are public can reshare out. Um, I'll just hurry up and end and say, um, as far as um, confronting or dealing with it, uh, MXGM really does engage in principle ideological struggle. And so as I, though I showed you those five, our six principles um, that we unify around and we organize around because MXGM is a mass association. We're not a cadre. Um, we actually found it with five principles and then through struggle and through women engagement as Mama Chiganji brought in the New African Women's Task Force, we adopted the ending sexism um, principle, continued on, um, which was like 2007, 
um, it's crazy how time is flying. Um, we challenged and we knew that we needed to expand our first principle so that folks really understood that when we say um, we want to free the Black nation, we're fighting for the human rights of all Black people. That's like all of us. Um, and then, um, so that's all of us, regardless of gender and sexuality and all of those things. I personally don't like binaries or any boundaries. Um, and so we are all here and welcomed. And then um, just in constitutionally or institutionally, our leadership um, is prized of, of two, we have like two coordinators. So I'm, have, I'm the national coordinator and then there's another national coordinator and our national coordinator, um, we have like guidelines on who those could be and it never any time could it be two men in those positions. Um, and it's a voted in um, election position, but two women of course could move and lead the organization. So those are just pieces where we are in our logical struggle, trying to ever advance and grow and do better and show up and do different. Um, and then also institutionally, we challenge ourselves to um, engage it and make sure that we're in the room, we're part of those conversations and we're there. Um, and then I would just say, we really do try to honor our histories. Um, when I hear stories from our elders, they talk about their comrades. And so while we might, as Salika was bringing up, might think like, oh, it's about some of these culture revolutionaries or these little small-minded people um, who can be heterosexist and transphobic and all of that. To hear stories from my elders, they bring in um, queer stories, they bring in women leadership, which was one of my lessons learned slides that I somehow <laughs> deleted, but um, they bring in those stories. And so um, they also demystify and challenge some of these larger narratives that um, actually doesn't equate to the history in which we were founded. Because even New African or Free to Land or Republic of New Africa, that was Queen Mother Moore a black woman um and so our history is grounded also in that if we go and do that study that sleep was bringing up cool anybody else do we have jamie back i'm just gonna scroll for more questions or if y'all see some questions hi so from the youtube live someone asked um did how can we study nahanda mama nahanda's work and did she write any books or is there any way that we can I'll further investigate and interrogate her work? Um, good question. There is a book in progress um, that was set to be actually published um, shortly before she made her transition. Um, the last information I have is that it'll be published this year, um, but that's, the, that's all I have. So I know that it's in progress. Um, there's also a documentary that's being put uh, done as well um, that due to her uh, untimely transition, the, it was in the middle of being completed. So that should be there as well. But um, you can also, there's a lot of information if you Google her, because um, there are a lot of, like she, because of some of the work that she did in the hip hop community, there are lots of articles that were um, done of her. And you know, at the one point where you could go back and forth to Cuba, pretty easily, uh, a lot of media went and they interviewed her and um, several of them did like extensive uh, documentary interviews, I would say, uh, Ebony Magazine being one, um, did a short piece on her. Um, and, but other than like, she doesn't have any published writings, but like I said, you can go and Google her and you'll find quite a bit of the work that she did. Great. There's also one saying, um, how do you support someone? How do you support someone who has been incarcerated when struggling to get past the barriers put in place by the prison system? For example, recorded and timed calls. Um, my issue is with these policies in general. So while trying to support, I feel angered by the surveillance and policing. Does that make sense? Does that example make sense for folks? Yeah, it absolutely does. That's that's the struggle that we have. Um, that's, you know, first of all, anything that you're talking about on a recorded line, don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble because they will cut you off. Um, but the, the, the struggle to to deal with not only political prisoners and prisoners of war, but our, our sisters and brothers that are behind the walls means that we have to address those issues. We have to protest those issues. We have to confront those issues. Um, 
we're not in control of this country. So, you know, anything to keep us from working to, to free our people is going to be done. Like I said, repression is real. So um, other than that, you know, the continuous keeping in touch to let so that they know, so the system knows that there are people looking at what they're doing when they're trying to brutalize us inside when they're trying to keep us from doing certain things. I, I could speak to like a couple of different issues that I, I would have uh, when I, I used to go visit Brother Matulu when he was here in um, Atlanta, I'd go visit him often. And uh, believe it or not, the sister guard was the one that gave me the most grief. And for some reason, she just didn't like me coming to visit him. I don't know if she was opposed to his politics or what, but she would give me grief. But I, whenever she would try to give me grief about coming in, I would ask to see her manager and I would write about it. So you have to do that. You have to follow up, you have to protest. You gotta be an activist. And you know, that's the whole work is activism. Hmm. I hope that addresses the question for you. Yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and I thank you for explaining definitely um, and as someone else also asked, are there any books you would recommend that spoke to you or something that has guided you along your activism? Lots of books. <laughs> um, I think, you know what, for a beginner that, um, I think Asada's autobiography is a great beginning. Um, and I also think that um, the autobiography of Malcolm X is an awesome beginning. Um, yeah, I think those give you like an insight, you know, I got quite a bit of insight from, um, Asada and, 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 um, and the work that she was doing and, and the kind of things that she had to deal with growing up and becoming an activist. Um, uh, and the same thing with the Mal autobiography of Malcolm X. I, others on the panel might want to share. Mm, I would say, ironically, those are my two, um, and oftentimes like Asada over Malcolm, maybe because I read in phrase or whatever, but just reading Asada Shakur's book, I was like, oh, identifiable in uh, like you say, other lessons. And it was like a whole little story with it. Um, and then I also said that I, um, I was often told like when you're just trying to figure something out or figure out how to do it, it would be dope to just read someone's autobiography. And so, um, in reading them, I would definitely lift up Ella Baker because I'm just in a lane of organizing with young people and then doing that grassroots on the ground type organizing. Um, so yeah. yeah. Anybody else, what's your books? I feel like it's not fair because it's also a Sada again. <laughs> I, was, I am reading some James Baldwin, throw him in there just for the points of it. But you know what? Okay, Asada, but also um, Coming Apart by Alice Walker was a really big one for me. And also The Womanist Reader, um, written by Lady <clears throat> Park as well. I was about to say, yeah, I would have to like go back in old syllabus. I took a women in hip hop one and that went far a breath of different books. Mm -hmm. Rachel, you came off me, what's your books? Yeah, I was going to say Asada, um, <laughs> her autobiography, which I had mentioned earlier. Um, I would also say um, A Taste of Power by Elaine Brown. I remember reading that and learning so many lessons there. Um, I would say also um, Huey P. Newton's Revolutionary Suicide. I remember reading that, I think either... It, as a grad student and I was I learned a lot of lessons there um and then I also liked um and learned a lot about even some of the things that Asada talked about with sexism even from like Soledad Brothers by um yeah I was just want to say about <laughs> by George that. Jackson yeah yeah, yeah yeah so yeah yeah those are some um recommended books some people are also putting some um, suggestions in the chat. Angela Davis's autobiography, definitely. Yep. Still brave words of fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have another, I have another recommendation. Um, Policing Black Lives by Robin Maynard. I really like that book because one, it talks about um, policing in Canada. Um, does deal with incarceration. It does talk about transness and it also interrogates um, aspects of sex work. 
I thought that was a really good work in terms of trying to think through um, abolition as well. So I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm gonna have to check that one out. Then I also see the revolution will not be funded. Be funded, yes, that's, that's a good help, one. Help this nonviolent stuff and get you killed. How guns made civil rights possible? Oh, and we also need. Um, mm-hmm. We will shoot back, Baba. I, hey, I don't want to put a plug in for one of our members. <laughs> but I want to say that it's really good. Uh, let's go and put in our, our, our plug for um. They they will shoot back and also uh free the land, brother. Free the lands, yeah. Let's go and put a shameless plug for uh. For our <laughs> I I was gonna say also that as I was um, learning about um sexism and the fight to end sexism and um developing womanism we read uh, from margin to center by bell oh yeah yeah i saw those that's, that's a good one yeah i'm like we have to cut and paste this chat box now. i know we need all of that for our, okay. our, our this, right so good. I, and I also saw a question oh um, sister outsider yes audrey lord absolutely yeah Sorry. and i'm not even gonna lie y'all sometimes i legit like to go to you once i try to figure out how to work youtube um, not that I'm that much older, but I can never find those fun viral clips from YouTube. So I legit would just start typing in the names. And I did that with Malcolm X, actually. I was like, I'm part of MXM and all of that. Who is he beyond these autobiographies? How can I hear him in his words? And so really learned um, deep about Malcolm X there. Really learned a lot about Fannie Lou Hamer um, with YouTube. Just really learned a lot about hearing either whether they were old speeches are all somehow recordings or old radio plugs. Um, yeah, so it says, what text can we learn to study more in accurate history of the role of the FBI in dismantling Black liberation movement? Definitely COINTELPRO 101. Um, and I think that's even a documentary. Um, but I would say that's a really, really, really great source. And I think they even tried to come out back with a COINTELPRO 2.0 and that really talks about it with hip hop and moving through that. And again, you might not see like, oh, what is that connection? Or again, all the maybe wrong things with hip hop. But if you see how COINTELPRO infiltrated um, the Black liberation and Black power movement, you will see like they started to maybe try to turn their tactics. And so where they were blowing up city blocks in Philadelphia would move on, I mean, with move nine, um, you then see that they, um, really maybe change your assaults, which we are seeing today. And mm-hmm. I think that that type of stuff would be definitely dope. And if it's about like getting your discipline up or movements, I would say definitely learning about other movements in general. Like let's learn about the Haitian revolution. I just pay old to it in the month of August, like digging um, through the Irish movement. When the Irish were black is a really good book. If you want to understand maybe why we'll never get to the promised land in the USA. Um, there's a question. Darn, Ola asked a question. But my screen keeps going up when new comments come down. Mama Chinganji, did you want to expand on what made Sister Nahanda use acupuncture to study that and bring it back to North America? While I try to find these other questions. You're on mute. Yeah, got it. <laughs> um, actually, she began doing work with Leak and Detox, which is where she ran into Matulu Shakur. Matulu had already began to study acupuncture, and there was a whole network of them that they got kicked out of Leak and Detox because they kept um, fighting against um, them using drugs to get them off drugs. So as you know, they began to look at different things to... Um, to began to deal with the detox program. And so Lincoln Detox kicked them out. And so they went on to start the Black Acupuncture Association of North America, um, which was an activist organization, basically. And they began to deal with that. And so her studies began there. And mm-hmm. she began to study acupuncture. She unfortunately had to go under before she completed and got her certification. But I do remember seeing her needles there uh, a couple of times. Okay. Anyone see the other question? Because I, I want to bring it in. It was about, I want to say, like supporting Black women or making the community safe. Yeah, I think it was a question that Ola asked. Yeah, oh, just found it. Yeah, you got okay. it. Okay, it says, what are the ways we can make the world of community organizing safer and more accessible to Black women and girls?
Say you muted. No, I was saying we lost my machine gun. Y'all was trying to step back. <laughs> step up, step up, or cool. But everybody went mute. <laughs> well, um, want to take it? Yeah, yeah, go for it. No, you can take it. You want to take it? No, sis, let's go for it. <laughs> Okay, all right. So what I'll do is I'll address the hashtag thing and that at the same time. Oh, good. Yeah. So, like, what are the ways um, we can kind of show up for Black women and girls? I think how do we make community organizing safer? So one of the things that I think a lot of you might be familiar with, I think a lot of us have a sort of educational background where we were used to teaching others. And one thing I will say is we can never really guarantee a safe space, but we can at least um, create safer spaces. Um, and one of those things is setting um, community guidelines, I think, in a lot of these spaces. Um, for one, so I will say, I also was a part of Freedom Schools. So sometimes I have that like, that Freedom Schools Children's Defense Fund <laughs> indoctrination. But I will say, setting up those guidelines um, at the top of events or um, at the beginning of certain spaces, could actually alleviate some of those things. Um, stressing also as well who the space is for and who you're actually showing up for in the process. Additionally, if people are not going to be in agreement, also specifying that there are ways to disagree without being harmful. Um, we wanna try to uh, really, really facilitate spaces where we're really thinking through um, harm reduction. You know, so if we're talking about um, black women and girls, also kind of giving them a space. But I will say this, like sometimes I am, I'm a little mixed on it, particularly since sometimes if we're talking about um, black women and girls, the implications that we're often talking about cisgender, uh, black women and girls. So there needs to be a way that it's communicated that we're not just talking about spaces for just cisgender um, women and girls. I think that we also have to figure out ways to honor those identities, particularly of little girls that people are constantly misgendering and they're still coming into their own. We have to figure out ways to cultivate spaces like that. And then also um, spaces where we're actually trying to make sure that we have a, um, safer spaces for Black women and queer folks as well, because I think that we have to be constantly on the move toward um, revolutionary care and revolutionary spaces. So I, I think that that's just one start of how we can address those things. And then also not making people feel bad. I think that we sometimes live in a culture where we're constantly um, speaking down to others, um, speaking with a certain type of authority. And what we need to be doing is meeting each other where we are. Instead of it looking like, oh, I'm, I'm teaching this thing to you. We're, we're teaching together. Um, and we're learning together. This is the work and, and that's important. Um, so I wanted to say that piece. As far as someone who had the question, I think you said Saliba, somebody was asking how are hashtags a sort of neoliberal function? Right. Okay, so when we're, when we're thinking, so sorry y'all, this is like the, the researcher hat thing coming on now, but I study um, digital public spaces and I look at digital intimacy specifically. One thing that I want us to remember is digital public. So when I say digital public spaces, any space that's public that can be found online. So technically um, YouTube is a digital public space depending on how you engage it. But a lot of us are on uh, Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on those kinds of platforms. And we must understand one, Facebook was started as a sort of platform where it was like an elitist platform where only people who had a specific um, a higher ed background could actually be on the site. Um, years down the line, those things changed. However, it did sort of foster um, a sort of uh, implication for a sort of neoliberal uh, push. And I'll explain something in a second um, as I talk about this terminology, what is known as frictionless sharing. Um, and frictionless sharing is actually the reason why we're able to distribute information online so easily. This actually was not always the case. I don't know if you remember this, but before 2010-ish in that area, it was actually like you had to copy and paste something and put it right there before you could even share it. Now with one click of a button or a click of a, a retweet, these things are easily shareable, but this was not always the case. However, this was a, a neoliberal push 
to actually keep tabs on individuals. So that's one thing I want to state. As far as something like Twitter, Twitter came on the scene um, and like right before the, the 2010s, um, like right before that period, but it was actually a way for a lot of um, tech users to work together. It first debuted actually at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. And it was just a way for people to communicate. It was a hit. Down the line, those hashtags and other things ended up becoming a tool for uh, Black liberatory movements to sort of keep in touch and stay on the ground. We've used it in so many ways. And also it's because Black people are very innovative people. Let's just face it. We always have a way of remixing things. And I think that there are actually scholars who talk about this, like a lot of Black scholars talk about how Black people have been able to use digital public spaces in radical ways, even though we know that we're using a neoliberal technology. And let's just face it, look at what's happening at TikTok, y'all. Uh, that man who's in office right now is trying to get rid of it. It might seem um, trivial, but that goes to show you if he can do something as simple as ban um, a, pub a digital public such as that, remember this could also happen to the other platforms that we're using um, in these radical ways. So I, I think that we need to be careful and think a little bit more about what are some ways that we can organize with each other and organize with access beyond digital public spaces. Yeah, that's what I was going to lift up too. I think it's like a both and like, yes, let's use it for a resource. Let's use it for, I wouldn't even say convenience, but I think we need to maybe deprioritize that at the same time, like maybe use it as the benefit because COVID which I wish that we would really take this as an innovation challenge on how we can build, connect, and advance our power. But then I do think it's something about getting back to the basics and knowing your block, knowing your community, knowing your resources. Um, definitely check out, we got a security training on Thursday, but I was gonna say, um, but yeah, I was gonna say, I think it's like both in. And like, we can't yeah. learn the sense of COINTELPRO and the tracking and then continue that same different behavior um like yes it's like i'm gonna go to, yeah yeah i almost said we might need to challenge the way we quote unquote call this call out behavior versus calling in like those who may or may not know me i like to be like oh that's so anti-black this in the space is that yes some of the things we may have done that's like culturally unique to us the ways like we get from our grandmamas and being in our families may be considered harmful now Again, as we grow, we do better. We want to become healthy. And also, it was something about not having your business out in the streets. And I feel like we have to look at a Twitter, a Facebook status, an Instagram story post or whatever, as that's a public postcard. And that's like, does everyone need to know that you're in beef with someone? Does everyone need to know that you've been harmed in a certain way? Deceased? And I bring that up because those were the lessons we were supposed to learn from the Black Power Movement, when there was a whole shootout on the campus between us organization and the Panther Party. And they was able to do that by inserting some different handwritten letters and inserting some different things, whereas we're given firsthand accounts through a status update. And so I think that it's just like both and. Yeah, and I think too, one, I'm glad that you're saying this too, Tali, because what we have to also remember too is in the last year, so we've also seen the rise of movements like ADOS, um, which is something that we really, because like, listen, like that, that was a hashtag that grew that really had like some really right wing, it has like right wing origins that people have not really attended to, but it grew because of these digital public spaces um, and all the misinformation that has been spread through this particular hashtag. So yeah, I think like to your point, it's both and we'll see what happens from here. Well, here's another question to bring into conversation. What's y'all's perspective on celebrities building their image around radical views without actually engaging with radicalism? I'm not sure if that makes sense. It does per se make sense. I just wonder how are we defining radicalism? But I'll throw it to other folks on the panel. When I saw that question, I immediately thought of Zalika because I feel like we always have these conversations. <laughs> and just because of like Zalika's work, not to put you on the spot, but I just feel like you always have really, really interesting insights on these things. Yeah. 
Um, (laughs) apparently they gave us some examples um, like from Mm -hmm. Beyonce with what comes to mind is Beyonce and Super Bowl I believe sorry y'all the chat box jumps as we type Um, some male rappers Kanye Jay-Z to the extent of Kendrick Lamar something he did with a Black Panther incident you you know I think that it's important to really um I think it's important to talk about the role that neoliberalism, once again, here's that word, has played um, in all of this. And this is not necessarily an indictment of any of the movements of the last um, five to seven years, but I think that this is something. So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna give it a compliment sandwich, as they say. Um, I think one of the the strongest suits um, and points about uh, Black Lives Matter as a movement, not to pick, not uh, necessarily as an organization, is that we were able to really um, push to the forefront a better gender and sexual analytic. That is one of the, I want to say, one of the wins of it. However, um, BLM is also a sort of um, point where, in combination with the hashtags, people were realizing that, you know, cultural um, productions during movements is not uncommon. So this means like, you know, throughout the decades, um, visual art music has always sort of helped us get through those, um, get through the the revolutionary work. So it's not uncommon, it's not wrong, it's not bad. However, a lot of um, celebrities during this time have used um, the movement to rebrand in some ways Um, They have commodified the movements in so many ways where they've even been willing to work with individuals who have actually been identified as literally traitors to the people who have um, sacrificed um, the people in a roundabout way. I'm not going to name those folk. I'm not going to do that right now. But what I will say is, as a result, this is why you see someone like Rihanna inviting someone who will not be mentioned Um, to her ball to accept some sort of humanitarian award. This is why, what would you say, Saliva? I was like, chat me offline. I want to know. I ain't in the know. Okay. (laughs) Um, This is why um, you have someone like um, Beyonce, who one of the few people that she followed on social media and interacted with in the movement, and I put that in quotes, was someone who wears the blue vest sometimes. Um, or all the time. We're not going to like name any names. Or no, not. not but, even, no more space to it. Right. So this is just sort of examples of how people have come in. However, what we've also seen is right now, I think it's a very unique period of time as we are talking about things such as abolition. We're talking about um, radicalism. And there are actually people ahistoricizing the work. All movements have to grow. All movements have made some mistakes and have had some challenges. However, as the times are moving forward, what we're seeing is that, for example, the the newest thing that I've noticed, uh, particularly when we're talking about celebrities, is there are a lot of people talking about Marxism. And there are certain organizations who are very hell bent on saying that they had a Marxist politic. It is okay if that was not the politic five to seven years ago. However, um, some some celebrities are not necessarily satisfied with their position as artists who could actually support radical. I want, yeah, I was going to want to bring that in and then I was going to ask my Chingaji of the Black Power Movement and different things. Because I know like artists made songs and Taste of Power. Elaine mm-hmm. Brown talks about using different roles with different folks to Jane Fonda's and another white dude. Um, but I wonder if is the question that maybe the ce- celebrities aren't getting it or are we just expecting more of them? And maybe their lane is to either entertain, maybe their lane is to introduce, maybe their lane is to pseudo popularize because then I get nervous when our stuff does become popular and the definitions don't follow, the history doesn't follow, the sacrifice doesn't follow, and then you can buy like a Tupac shirt and Target or, you know, <laughs> or Bob Marley in Forever 21. So, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to also bring in that piece. Like, is it on them to do that? Or is it on 
Beyonce to wear yellow in a video and now folks are rediscovering or wanting to engage um, African spirituality. So Mama Chinaji, was there like a time like that in the 70s? I'm thinking of the Afros was coming fly, James Brown came out with I'm Black and I'm Proud. I don't know if he ever showed up to a protest. Like, yeah, he did. I, mean, I think that that, I think I mean, he, our, our role as activism, as activists, sorry, as revolutionaries is to utilize every avenue that we have that's going to talk about our movement. Don't expect anything else. Don't expect anything else, but utilize that. You know, I think the, the information that comes out, I mean, I, I looked at an interview um, just like this last week with uh, that Talib Kweli did with, uh, Kweli did with uh, Common about his experience going to Cuba and meeting Asadam. He had read the book and he was very interested in going to Cuba and meeting her. And so in his interaction with her, he came back and wrote the song about Asada. That's, that's a really important lesson and thing that we can utilize, you know, to promote. People read that, when they heard that song, probably thousands, I don't even know how many people probably said, oh, I gotta read that book, I've never heard of her. Um, so the things like that, we can utilize it, but don't, don't expect anything else. Don't expect anything else and don't get confused you know, by it. We're, we're in a period now where it's popular to talk about Black Lives Matter. You know, it's in vogue, just like, you know, as I was coming up in the 70s and, you know, the Black and I'm Proud and Black Power, that was popular, you know, and we, we as revolutionaries, we have to use that to promote things in our community, promote work, you know, but don't get, don't get it twisted. They're not, they're not revolutionaries and they're not activists. So we don't put that blanket on them at all or expect that from them, but we are going to utilize the information that they're, the way that they're getting the information out. That is so, so true. Uh, and I want to say something else, but I also want to be disciplined as I'm sure we all are ready to break fast for August. Um, right? I was like, oh, this is, a, this is a before thing. We got three yeah, minutes I'm, left. I'm hungry. Okay, yo. And uh, again, check out MXCM National if you all want to introduce to... Um, Black August and fasting training study, all of that. But we got three minutes left. We know we came here tonight to lift up, introduce, and talk about Sister Sada and Mama Nahanda, um, also to raise up new African womanism. Um, and, you know, I feel like the righteous place of women being in leadership, not antagonists to men. Um, are there any like little tidbits we would want to share? Or definitely big ups to you all who stayed on these two hours with us. Um, yeah, like what would be y'all's closing remarks? Um, I, I'll go first as the elder. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, inviting us to do this teach-in. I'm excited about the, the questions that we have received and probably the other ones that, that are on YouTube that we did not see, but Jamie, thank you for putting this together. Th thank you for you and the Black Radical Women for putting this together. Um, I think it's overdue. I'm looking forward to um, part two and um, free to land. Free to land. Does anyone else have any closing remarks? I just want to say this was just such an amazing space to be in. Like, you know, I knew that of course, like the comrades that I have, like I already know that they're like amazing, but even just like seeing all of the comments in the chat, since I'm, since my camera is not working, I've been trying to engage with folks through the chat and, you know, there's just so much brilliance there. So I'm just really grateful to have shared space with everyone. And I hope that we just continue to stay connected. I did um, just post our website again um, and just posted, um, our Twitter and our Instagram page. So just please stay connected with us. And we also are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I say yes. Um, yes, yeah, so big ups. Thank you, Asante Sana, for everyone who came tonight. Um, thank you so much, Mama Shinganji, for sharing and speaking and bringing your comrade into this space. Um, ever grateful. Thanks, panelists and Jamie. Thank you for this invite and this idea. And everyone, I mean, I'm happy to now be able to see the chat box, couldn't see it while I was sharing, but um, I'm just so full of 
I'm very grateful for the life you all have given um, to know that we will win. Um, liberation is ours. Um, our history tells us that. And so, um, Ashe, will there be a study group? We're definitely interested in it. So we're down to um, put that together. We've been chatting offline about it. So um, yeah, definitely connect via the social medias. Um, and yeah, big ups, you all. Definitely, you know, you're righteous. It's, it's just stated for Black women to, we have skin in the game. And when I say women, it's the expansive to the most expansive defining of that term of uh, fem and uh, non-boundary. I like to non-conform myself. And so, yeah, just free to land. Thank you all for this space. And I look forward to the continued times. Oh, well, I don't know if Z wanted to say anything, but um, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, you were, I didn't know if you were muted or not, but I just wanna say thank you to our amazing panelists. Like there was so much interaction on YouTube, on Twitter, on this chat. Um, it's an honor to thank you, Mama Chinganji, for everything and for you know sharing about your comrade, your friend. I appreciate it so much. And I just, to Taliba, Duration, of course, the Thank you for your insights. And I'm really thankful for this event to be the kickoff of Black Women Radicals Black August. Um, and I wanna thank particularly Z for, um, as a friend, uh, for bringing this idea and, and us collaborating and everyone saying yes. So thank you so much to everyone. And I hope that you really, from this conversation, um, saw the revolutionary politic and, and, and commitment that Nahanda and Asada had and have, and that we need to go beyond the aesthetic and really live what we, pra and practice what we preach. It's beyond aesthetics, it's about praxis. So thank you so much, everyone. This will be available on Black Women Radicals YouTube, and please be safe out there, and looking forward to seeing y'all again. All right, have a good one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>